Opportunities, challenges, and trade offs. It's going to be uh, a very uh, informative and engaging two days. As we all know, oh, I should take who I am. My name is Mindy Benson. I'm the Dean of the HALP School of Environment and Natural Resources. We teach both undergraduates and graduates here at the University of Wyoming uh, in environment and natural resource issues. We also are home of the Ruckles House Institute, which is hosting the event today. And this is exactly the type of venue that we create, pulling people together from a diversity perspective to talk about emerging environmental challenges. So we're so pleased to have you all here. As we all know, Wyoming is an energy state, and we're so rich in natural resources, not only with mineral resources, but also with wind and solar. We also very much value our open spaces, our wildlife, and finding ways to balance all of these opportunities and benefits is going to be part of the discussion today. I want to thank Nicole Corfanta and Rob Gabi, the, the people who have really done the hard work of organizing and putting together this conference. <clears throat> and also to recognize our sponsors, our co-sponsors for this conference, which include the Strook Forum on Wyoming Lands and People, the Center for Law and Energy Resources in the Rockies, and the Walton Family Foundation. Another one of our sponsors is the School of Energy Resources, and unfortunately, Mark Northam is not able to join us this morning. So the task of, uh, and pleasure of introducing Rick Gordon will fall to me here in a moment. But I just wanted to make note uh, that one of the things that truly makes the University of Wyoming unique and very powerful in, in respect to our ability to take on uh, very interesting topics like how we're going to develop wind energy in the state is that the School of Natural Resources and the School of Energy here have a real partnership. We, we very much uh, value our opportunities to engage with one another and uh, see that connection as being uh, critical to the success of the state. So without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, to you uh, Mark Gordon, the state treasurer for the state of Wyoming since 2012. We are inviting Mark to provide opening remarks, not only because he is the proud daughter of a Howe School alumnus, but also um, because his history in the state really spans the types of and the diversity of um, issues and activities that um, we also value. Not only has he been involved with energy development and agriculture, but also with recreation and tourism. So he's really uniquely qualified to uh, uh, sort of embrace the multiple perspectives uh, that we are going to be engaging today. <clears throat> so Mark, please come on up and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Mindy. Uh, it really is an honor to be introduced by you, and thanks for uh, stepping up at this moment. And uh, good morning. Before I begin, uh, I just want to take a moment to think about the unfortunate people in Las Vegas. Uh, really a tragic moment. Um, and um, just, just want to take a second to do that. You know, it's a beautiful day here in Laramie, as you all know. <laughs> and, and Wyoming is a good place to learn about wind and snow. Um, but really, Wyoming is consistently ranked as one of the top states for the resource, as anyone living here has personal experience uh, with. But I want to welcome you to the Wind Energy Forum. And I want to appreciate the fact that Mindy and, and Nicole and Rob, you uh, started all this off with a, uh, with a politician. 
I'm not sure exactly what that means, but over the next days, members of this group here today uh, will have the opportunity to hear from an array of experts, a really truly outstanding array of experts that the university has pulled together uh, on this topic, and it couldn't be more timely. Let me begin by thanking the Rockefeller Institute, the School of Energy Resources, and all the others that have made this, um, this forum come together. And I guess I want to take a moment and say that as this list of organizers show, in Wyoming we care a lot about energy and the environment. We also care a lot about our economy. And UW does indeed have the prowess in a multitude of natural resource issues and a unique ability to foster such an informative and valuable conversation about wind energy's role in our future. I want to thank you for being here, braving the weather, and I'm certain we'll all get a lot out of the next couple of days. But has there ever been a more exciting time in energy? Really think about it. In some respects, energy supply, energy supply has been solved. There is, in fact, an abundance of all kinds of energy. It is everywhere. In Wyoming, we have a lot of it. We have coal and oil and gas, uranium, and lots and lots of sun and wind. We have so much of it, in fact, that we can afford to have opinions, strong opinions, about how it's generated, used, transported, and consumed. But this is also a pivotal and important time for energy. Because not only is there an abundance of supply and sources, but we stand at the point of tremendous technological change. Have you ever seen such an exciting time where we have more opportunities to deploy different kinds of technology, design cutting edge infrastructure, like grids that can manage the multitude of energy sources, as well as how to deliver more reliable and cleaner and efficient stream of electrons to consumer, and for that matter, isn't it exciting that we are also pioneering, pioneering new ways to use energy? All of this innovation is going to better our lives, has bettered our lives, and it's really an incredible time to be alive. But what about public policy? Is it up to the task? Will our policy support the transition to a new energy future or hold it back? And at what cost? We hope that our policy response to development will affect the place we love beneficially. What can we expect for the jobs of the future? What might happen to the places we like to hunt or fish? Will our vista still be as majestic and continue to attract the tourists that drive Wyoming's second most important industry? Will we have to sacrifice our wildlife populations and environments so that others can enjoy cheap, reliable, and abundant energy? All of these are interesting topics that we'll explore over the next couple of days. I think back to when I was young and pretty sure of myself, and I came back to the family ranch after college. I knew I had a way to improve our ranching operation. If we would just update the way we did things, brought them up to speed with the latest ideas, I would sure we'd make more money, run more cows, and have more free time. After all, I had studied ecology, biology, history, economics, and a whole lot of other stuff I'd learned a bunch. I knew I had the latest science on my side. And when I pointed out how smart I was to my dad, However, he sometimes wasn't quite so impressed. Turns out that he had experience too in a view about the practical side of changes that I intended to make, and I sometimes had missed the practical side. I soon learned that experience was not always a kind teacher, as I had hoped. My daughter B, who when they graduated from the Hobbs School uh, recently, now wants to come back to the ranch, and I am the one now who's talking about the experience, and she is the one who's talking about the knowledge. Progress, technology, and the new ways to look at things are what we do as humans, and we have all benefited as a result. And I'm truly amazed by the promise of technology these days, as I have said. Weighing technological advance within the context of our own experience, however, is crucial to success. 
Today, technology makes it possible for us to determine the sex of a calf on a ranch, for example, or even when it's born, just a few weeks after conception. That knowledge allows us to make management decisions that were never possible for my dad. And occasionally, today, even now, with all that technology, with all that technology, excuse me, as happened last week, occasionally we forget to bring the power cord. Progress is never in a straight line. And the pace of change is never predictable. It is always too fast or too slow, depending on one's point of view, market conditions, public policy, or opportunity. Nevertheless, conversations like these can help us to prepare for change, whatever that may be, and whenever it may come. I'm gonna ask you now to try to get ready for the day. No matter how open-minded we think we are, we all have certain habits and biases. It's something my daughter B reminds me of every once in a while. Each of you has a unique perspective that will add to the value of this forum, so don't worry. You were asked to come here to share that point of view, and we don't want you to change it. But for the fun of it, let's begin. What I want you all to do is to cross your arms comfortably. Stay that way. You know, what's funny about this is that this is the way voters would usually greet me when I show up and say, hi, I'm a politician. <laughs> but maybe it's the way landowners greet wind developers or wind developers greet regulators. Maybe it's the way lawyers greet each other. But now I want you to cross your arms the other way. Try it. It's awkward. It's awkward. It's different, but it's not impossible. And some of us can do it a little bit easier than others. But how does that apply to this program? You can just relax now. <laughs> how does this apply to the program? Well, here's how. I want you to speak and question from that comfortable posture, the first one you took. But I want you to listen from the other posture. Listen carefully to what others say over the next couple of days, but speak from your heart. What role will wind play in our energy portfolio? How will we develop it? What benefits can it bring? What trade-offs are we willing to accept? And how can we mitigate potential problems? These are all the things this, this forum is about. Over the next couple of days, will give us an opportunity to learn more about development, technology, landscape protection, how wind affects wildlife and livestock, how it will affect communities, how it will affect our economy, transmission and siting, public policy, public perception, and taxation. Wind development is in some ways similar to other types of development, but it's also unique. And the value of wind energy for Wyoming is a question this state will continue to deliberate in the coming years. Elsewhere, some have already made up their minds, as you know. For example, last week I attended a conference that some of the largest and most influential investors in the country attended as well. And over and over again, I heard a drumbeat to stop investing in fossil fuels for climate change. In their view, renewables were entirely benign and the only right thing to do to save the world from climate change. The arguments behind so-called environment, social, and uh, governance ESG investing are becoming more and more of a force every day. Just in the last two years, they've gone from 2% to nearly 10% of all institutional portfolios. But even one of the most outspoken of these investors, Japan's National Pension, which has over a trillion dollars in assets, had to admit that when their country had uh, experienced Fukushima, they had to rely on coal to light their lights and power the country. To their credit, though, and it's really remarkable, the Japanese have built the most efficient and clean-burning coal-fired electric generation fleet in the world, with emissions that are quite close to those of gas-fired plants. Technological advancement is not confined to only the most fashionable sectors. I worry that investors do not always think through the implications of the prescribed rapid shift in energy supply. 
How such a change will affect our communities, the jobs, the industries, and the infrastructure needed. These are all considerations sometimes over, overlooked in the simplistic sweeping pronouncements that we hear on a national stage. ESG investing can sometimes seem more geared towards currying favorable public opinion than to understanding all that accompanies, accompanies a radical reorientation of policy. But others might poo poo renewables, maintaining they can never replace more conventional sources of energy. Renewables, they say, are too unreliable and expensive to survive without government subsidy. And yet, daily costs are coming down on solar and wind. More and more of Iowa powers, for example, of Iowa's power, for example, is derived from wind. And it is possible that parts of West Texas can run entirely now on a combination of wind, solar, and biomass within just a few years, thanks to efficiency improvements and better battery technology. So we see that neither notion is entirely correct. And we see that technology is advancing across the spectrum of supply. Our energy future is not and cannot be binary, either this or that. It is, in fact, exciting that there is such a smorgasbord and we have plenty of time to choose from that menu. Our choices and the nation's choices will have consequences to our workers, our industries, and our communities. A sensible energy future would recognize the value of a permanent, educated, and flexible workforce with skills that translate across industries, enabling workers and companies alike to capitalize on the ebbs and flows of freer energy markets. I believe Wyoming can create that opportunity if we recognize the value of teamwork. In Wyoming, we have experience with policy choices made elsewhere. We also recognize no matter what, whether it's renewables like wind, fossil fuels like coal, or something else like constituents of newfangled battery technologies, most likely, if it has something to do with energy, it's going to happen here in Wyoming. That is what makes our work here so fun. We have sun, wind, hydro, geothermal, nuclear, natural gas, oil, uranium, and coal. We live in a time of unprecedented technological innovation. Our opportunities are almost endless. Yet we also live in one of the most beautiful places on Earth. We are the headwaters of some of our nation's mightiest rivers, the home of some of the longest and most interesting migration routes for deer, elk, and antelope. We are the home of two of our nation's most loved national parks and her oldest. We are, in fact, the state that historian T.A. Larson once described as the state everyone else would like to be if they had the chance to do it again. If we don't get this right, who can we blame? There's little question that Wyoming's wind portfolio will be meaningful to the nation. It is also increasingly clear that our energy future must be diverse. Ideally, the advent of a new industry should complement rather than threaten another. The contributions of a viable wind industry to our state cannot be overstated. Skilled manufacturing, valuable construction and maintenance jobs, and a host of other ancillary positions will benefit our state, diversify our sources of income, and provide important anchors to our communities if we forthrightly approach the challenges that are coming our way as we generate transport and use energy. <coughs> being open to new ideas while being mindful of the value of what makes Wyoming so special will fortify a revitalization of our economy, our towns and cities, foster enterprise, and ensure that Wyoming will continue to be a leading energy state in the nation into the next decade. The goal of today's program, as Nicole puts it, was to share the best available information with foreign participants so that we can have a well-informed and thoughtful dialogue, the opportunity to learn from one another, and lay the groundwork to power this great nation well and thoughtfully into the future will require vision. Thank you for coming. And thank you, UW, and all the parties who pulled such a great program together. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be, forgive me, a charged conversation. So let's get to it. <laughs>